Welcome to Video Church. We're studying in Video Bible the book of Zephaniah. We've been in Zephaniah taking it one step at a time, step by step reading in the scriptures and discovering and uncovering for ourselves what it is that Zephaniah, being a prophet of God, had to say to the people of God. We often say here at Vidivo Church, the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, about Jesus. The reason being is because I want to get out from under the mantle. I want to get from out from under the responsibility. I don't want to be held accountable for what you do with what you are learning. Because frankly, I think you're a little weird. <laughs> now, how many pastors are going to tell you that? Well, first of all, I'm not a pastor. Oh, you, I thought you were a pastor. Well, no. That's just a common term that nowadays is used for anybody, anywhere, everywhere, just to say that they're a minister of God. As a matter of fact, I had a guy contact me. He says, well, are you a pastor? I said, no, I'm a preacher. He says, oh, okay, so you're the pastor. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I know what that means, and I am definitely not a pastor. I said, now, I don't find too many pastors around because I see that they're using this word pastor much like they would call Jesus rabbi. Well, rabbi technically is someone who was halakhically or Judaically a person who was accountable and responsible for a certain teaching based upon his master. In other words, he would be held up by the shoulders of the other. He would stand on the shoulders of his rabbi. And that isn't what Jesus was. He didn't really claim the title Rabboni or Rabbi, but that they assumed it or they presumed to call him that because he did teach. He was not the Rabbi, but he was in fact the Son of God. What God called him was, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So he wasn't a Rabbi, so don't make that mistake that a lot of people today make. He was not considered a rabbi by the people. He was not assigned a rabbi. He just said, who could teach like this for such as he speaks with authority? He speaks like our rabbis did, or our sages do, or our prophets did, or those that were from before, but Jesus didn't speak like them, saying, well, in the name of Hillel, in the name of so-and-so, you know, I'm speaking. Well, Jesus spoke as I say unto you, as though he were starting something new. And Jesus himself said that he was after the order, or he's spoken of by Paul as being after the order of Melchizedek, who had no genealogy. He was not before, he was not after. He was as he is. And such as it being, that was what Jesus is. And that's why I don't like to be called really a pastor, because first of all, God himself, speaking to Michael, myself, never called me pastor. He said, preach. And I went, okay. And then later he called me a preacher. When he called Vidivo Church into being, he didn't say, go start a ministry. No, he said, this is it. You do it. You know, because I was complaining about a church that I know down the street and then a church that I know up the street and a church I know across the street and a church I know down across and over and into the meadows and through the woods that really I kept saying, God, what are they doing? You know, I mean, it's like, ugh, and ick, and I, I couldn't understand how they could be off and on and kind of like, you know, roller coaster ride. So God said, you do it. And I went, do what, Lord? He says, start a church. And I went, okay. So God showed me where to start one, and it's down the street. We are the only all outdoor church, although right now you're saying, well, wait a minute, what are you doing indoors? Well, we're Vidivo Bible right now. <laughs> when we meet for the church, we meet outside. You know, we're all over the place outside, but we technically we meet down the street at 89th and North Main, and that's in the city of North Salt Lake, and if you come there on Sundays, you'll see we meet there. We assemble in the outdoor rotunda. That is where we gather together, much like Jesus had a favorite spot he gathered, but he didn't stay in a synagogue. Like some people think that he assumed, they assume falsely that he had a base of operations in Capernaum or Kephar Nahum, as it said in Israel. But it wasn't like that. Unfortunately, Jesus went around everywhere and his motto or his reality of what he told his disciples is follow me. 
Foxes have holes, birds have their nests, but know where the Son of Man to lay his head. He was a vagabond preacher. He was, you could say, the ragamuffin preacher. Much like Chris Rice, I think, or Chris somebody, or whoever it was, came up with the ragamuffin gospel. Jesus was not relegated inside the synagogue or in the temple only. He performed those duties as he would, according to the law, come to present himself and then also give teaching and give testimony of what he had learned. But the fact of the matter is the Sermon on the Mount is the Sermon on the Mount, and that's outside, much like most of us, what we do at Vidivo Church, or all that we do is outside. Vidivo Ministry, doing Vidivo Bible, we do inside, like this book of Zephaniah. So we've been presenting that as part of the church in the sense that you could study at home and listen and learn. And so we've been in Zephaniah studying because Zephaniah was a prophet of God and he had something to say to us today. He is speaking directly to me. I'm hearing what God has to say to me today so I can listen and learn what I have to do this day that I live in because Jesus is coming soon. And because I know that for a fact, I have lived it all my life, all these 40 years of being in ministry with the Lord, as God says, everyone who is born again is in ministry. You may not think of it that way, because you may think ministry is some formalized religious, you know, ceremony where you received a doctorate and you had the laying on of hands and the elders, you know, put their hands on you and said, Thus saith the Lord, you are in ministry. Well, and this is your gift, I'll tell you. Well, that's not the way Jesus does it. He says, follow me. And the disciple got up and followed him. From that moment on, he was in ministry, following Jesus. He was one of Jesus' followers. And that's what it means to be in ministry, really. Now, you could add your own religious dogma and doctrine, and according to your sect, go ahead. But according to the founder of whom I'm following, Jesus, I've been in ministry since I got saved, because the moment I got saved, I ran right out and started telling people about Jesus that night. I came home from being saved and witnessed to my mother. And every moment of her life from that moment on, I was witnessing to her. <laughs> God knows I was persistent, little devil. <laughs> or saint. But then she got saved despite me. I mean, she got saved eventually, but it wasn't just because I witnessed to her. No, believe me, she got saved because she was, you know, God was working on her. But my... Just in saying all this is for you to not be, you know, caught up in some kind of mentality where right now I know down the church, you know, I get a little upset because now they're doing this, you know, find your gift. Let me tell you what your gift is. Take the spiritual gifts test, you know, find out what you like to do and see if that's what God wants you to do because God wouldn't put you to do anything that you don't want to do. So if you want to do it, then that must be what he's got you to do because otherwise he wouldn't do it to you to what you're doing. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, but taking up your cross and following Jesus isn't about getting what you want. It's doing what he says. And so that's why we always talk about at Vidivo Church the Spirit of God leading you, leading me. The Spirit of God opening our eyes to see, giving us ears to hear, causing our heart to be open, making it available to us so that we would understand and comprehend what is the mind of God or the mind of Christ, giving us discernment, giving us wisdom, causing fruit to grow in us, that we would have the peace of God that passes all understanding and grow in the love of God that is such that we could love our enemies in such a demonstrative way that they would even be amazed by how we are able to have joy in the midst of our sufferings. So in and of itself, Religion is nice when Christianity presents it, but sometimes Christians get a little carried away about this violence and protectionism that they're into. That's why we here at Vidivo Church don't do it that way. But in Zephaniah's day, he had the same issue, because as we talked about in Zephaniah part one, we were talking about the children of Israel and God speaking to them and how they weren't doing what God said to do. As a matter of fact, God told them in Zephaniah, our first part was about seek the Lord. And that was interesting because in Zephaniah chapter 1, in, I believe it is, um, oh, where did we end at? I think it was 2, 3. So in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3, we summed up part 1 as being, what should we do and what is God saying for us to do after warning us of all these things he's going to do unto us that if we want to be spared the rapture, or if we want to be given the rapture and spared the great tribulation, then we have to do what it says in verse chapter 2 of, uh, verse 3 of, verse, blah, blah, blah. we have to do what chapter 2 says to do in verse 3. 
How do you like that for turning it around and making it like sing song C? So saying that, it reads, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness and seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. And so we knew that and we talked about how the Lord's anger is being poured out and there will be churches that go into great tribulation. That's obvious to me. Christians are debating it and arguing about it and they're false. I mean, no offense, but there's no way they can say that when you just add the quiz question to them uh, can I ask you a question? What about one of the churches in the letters to seven churches? Doesn't it say they go into great tribulation? Or, you know, I mean, given that, when it says 50-50, does that mean that, you know, two in the field, one should be left, one should be taken? That means that the other person wasn't a Christian? In other words, they're not going to answer you the answer you want to hear. Well, yeah, you're right. I'm wrong. Now, of course, they're not going to say that. They're going to come up with some explanation rather than realization that God speaks what he says and says what he means and it's obvious of what it says. You don't have to have an explanation for it. You just read it and you know it. That's pretty simple. And that's the way it was in Zephaniah's day. So there was God warning the people and the children of Israel to seek the Lord. And it might be. He may spare some of you. He didn't say he would. And we talked about how there's no rapture disaster, you know, that's going to happen. There's no you know, automatic, you know, rapture um, insurance policy that just because you're saved, you get to go. Oh, you know, whoa, you know, and guess what? On the day you don't go, you're where you're going to be. You know, I mean, are you going to give up Jesus? So Zephaniah in part two, we were talking about a lot of what's going on today in Israel, even with Gaza and with with the children of Israel today not following God and not doing what God says, but following after humanism and how the government of Israel is false and wrong and doing things that are contrary to what God has told them to do. A lot of American Christians think that they have to automatically accept Israel as it is, the way it is, such as it is, and just say, God bless you, we want you, and we support you. I don't support you, baloney. They're going to sell out their own people. You think I'm going to support that? No, when they go to make a treaty with the Antichrist, I'm not agreeing with them. I'm telling them they're wrong and tell them to repent. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And as a matter of fact, Zephaniah said the same thing when we got to chapter 3 in verse 2. She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, and she drew not near to God. So we concluded in the second part of Zephaniah that after seeking the Lord, we needed to draw near to the Lord so that the Lord would draw near to us. We needed to realize that God wanted to speak to us, that God wanted to address things that were happening in our nation as well as in the nations around the world, and we could see how he dealt with them so that we could know that he's going to deal with us in our own obstinance, and our own fear of failing or fear of walking apart from maybe the church down the street and having to have a personal relationship that we are accountable for. Because, you see, I'm not going to be accountable for you unless you want to live in my house, you know, and follow me for about three and a half years, and then I'll train you and I'll disciple you. Sure, no problem then. But if you're not going to make that commitment of living with me, I'm not discipling you or being accountable to, because that's what a pastor should be doing. He should be living with the people, not just staying there on a Sunday day and say, hey, uh, yeah, by the way, come on in, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll be your uh, <coughs> pastor, you know, and then I'll take care of you, you know, as long as you contribute. I don't think so. That's just, you know, kind of what the modern version of a pastor teacher that a lot of people want to say is the modern venue. I went to a community church and that pastor, man, if you didn't make it Sunday, he was knocking on your door come Sunday night. <laughs> he wanted to know, are you all right? That's all he wanted to know. And that's what a pastor is. He knows you by name. Matter of fact, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. And Jesus is called the good shepherd. He isn't one of those ones that we have today that don't even know you by name. So Zephaniah now, I think we're going to finish up the entire book. Because after all, we are in chapter 3, and we're starting in verse 2, and we're going to read that through, hopefully, all the way to the end, which is the end of chapter 3. And we should be able to get through it today, tonight, this way, and wherever you are, whatever time you are, in the way that God wants to present to you this day, the word of the Lord that he's speaking to you, as he says in this book, through Zephaniah, so that you would know that you heard God's word. You didn't just read and bleed and, you know, put in me what you think you understand or, you know, pick and choose what you want to lose or what you want to live or what you don't want to do. But rather, you've heard what God has said and you know that because he said it, he's going to do it. So at least you have the opportunity to let the Spirit of God make application to you as the people of God in some way what God wants to say to you today. Ah, 
Delicious. Oh, by the way, you didn't think I was going to rhyme that, did you? <laughs> How do you like our new venue? <laughs> We're working on this to be last generation network news so that with a different camera, I think, maybe this camera, maybe a different one, we're going to have, you know, news stories, and in last generation network news, we're probably going to do commentary on end times news, or last day's news, last generation news, I should say, that um, I have a news service I've been doing for years and years and years and years, you know, and, and uh, I lived over in Israel, and I've, you know, I even um, at one time worked, well, I was involved with the Orange County Register at one time. I was on the front page, you know, because I was in a rowboat, and they put me out in a rowboat and strung me out and said I was swimming for my life. Well, I wasn't, but that's how news works. And nowadays, you know, we've heard Bill O'Reilly going off on tangents about yelling at people that are on the Internet, yelling at people that he doesn't agree with, yelling at people that have confronted him in his sin. Oops, oh no, Mr. Bill, Ooh. You know, and he's blown it, you know, but... That's kind of where, you know, you see pride enter in when sometimes we just need the news rather than the views of what the people or the person is saying. Well, Last Generation Network News, we want to talk about that in light of not just the scriptures, because anybody can read the scripture and not apply it, but we want to talk about it in light of what Jesus would say and Jesus would tell us today through the events that are happening in the world. And so that's the gist of what we want to do, but without it being something that interests you, like putting back here, you know, this computer thing running, you know, because that's what we'll do, because this is being projected from my computer in the back room. Then, you know, it would be kind of hard to, you know, like turn around and say, okay, now let me point out this to you, you know, and see how these are going like this, and this is where Israel is, and this is the nations, you know, and this is the war, and this is, you know, Palestine. <laughs> I know, people hate that when I say that. Well, what do you mean there was no Palestine? What do you think the newspaper was called? The Palestine News. I mean... Dare I say that just because the tribes were assembled together in Israel that they, you, you don't think that there was a Palestine? I mean, good God, talk about a propaganda war that's been going on for a long time now to where even some people in America believe it. Give me a break. Yes, God has given the land to the children of Israel, but they were buying it ever since 1800. So, you know, Israel bought most of what they own, and then some of the land that they hadn't purchased, yeah, the United Nations gave it to them, and yeah, in 67 war, yes, they took it, just like we did. I mean, we are illegal in a lot of the lands we took, but that's what Israel has done too. Of course they're illegal, but at least admit it, you know, so we can say occupied territories because they are occupied. It's not the, anything wrong with saying that word. It just means that they got occupied and now they got taken, kind of like what we did with California. I mean, you name it, man. We were one of the biggest occupiers in the world of taking over in our colonialism, and Israel's doing the same by building settlements and doing things illegally that the United Nations condemns, you know, and then we pretend like we agree and don't agree at the same time. Phooey, let's stick with what the Word of God says, but that's what we're going to do with Last Generation Network News, address those kind of things that are happening in the world, hopefully. If it works out this way and we get the right camera, because the camera is, even if I put the camera up close, it just still gives a distant shot, so trying to figure out which camera to use and whether or not it'll do high def well enough. So, getting into Zephaniah and getting back to the word of the Lord by the Spirit of God, you know, to the people of God and the Son of God, Jesus, we um, want to look at and read from verse 3, chapter 3, verse 2. She obeyed not the voice. You know, that's what's interesting to me right off the bat. I, you you got to get there. You know, I mean, that was the thing we ended with partially last week, or last week, last time we were assembled together to study Zephaniah, she obeyed not the voice. Now, this isn't the voice that you watch on television, you know, that singing competition. This isn't the voice in your head, like somebody tells me, you know, that I should be locked up because I hear voices. Well, I don't hear voices, I hear the voice. I hear the voice of the Lord, my God, Jesus, speaking to me by way of the Spirit of God, giving me ears to hear, so that I can hear what the Spirit of God would say to me by using God himself, Jesus, speaking to me. And Jesus has spoken to me audibly, meaning with these ears, out here, I hear God at times speak to me. And I have heard him speak to me, and he's called me by name, and I have, he asked me, you know, you know, some questions that confronted me, and I had to answer them, you know, it's like, ouch, so don't think that meeting Jesus is all kissy, kissy, huggy, huggy. It's a very, you know, what do you say? I mean, 
wow, you know, I never even thought I'd wind up saying that to me, but, you know, um, I didn't expect to bring, bring up the voice, you know, and bring up, you know, my personal experience with Jesus, but God has spoken to me, you know, and, and I mean, on the one hand, it's marvelous. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's the most, you can't, there's no word. You can't say awesome, marvelous, magnificent, you know, I mean, there's just no word. And uh, you'll be changed forever. I mean, you'll never deny that he spoke to you. You can't. You know, you can't question. There's no questioning it. You might doubt it, you know, some down the road, but you're never really going to be able to deny it. You know I mean? It's like talking to, you know, someone else, you know, right in front of you. You know, you can't deny what's said. I mean, you, maybe in most people's minds you can kind of like distort it and change it to something. I don't know, but not with Jesus. If Jesus speaks to you, you'll know, you know, and... And then when people are dumb enough to try to confront you and say, well, I'm just a boy, you, know, you just look at them and think, man, you have no idea. There is no way it was anything but Jesus. That's why, you know, I mean, some people follow angels and they're, they're, they're liable to be deceived. And some people may follow, you know, Mary, the mother of God, and I'm sure they're deceived, but I got news for you. When Jesus speaks, ain't no doubt about it. So, Saying this, that's part of what we were talking about last week, and I want to bring that up a little bit more to reiterate. If you settled for anything less than God's, the old expression is, if you settle for anything less than God's best, then you settled for less than what God wants to give you. And it's not that God wants to give you prosperity, because that's just a test. If God gives you prosperity, it isn't meant for you. It's meant for you to go give it to someone else. He wants to see if you're going to hoard it or give it. Because whatever God gives you, he wants to work through you to someone else. He doesn't want you to be rich. He doesn't want you to be prosperous. He wants you to use that and give it out for the kingdom of God's sake, not to keep for yourself. If you keep the least of it, then it might be unto you putrid worms and canker sores, and it might turn into rot for you, because that's what happens when the children of Israel went in and Saul was told, don't keep any of it. Don't keep even the cattle or the riches or the wealth or the children or anything. Burn it. Get rid of it. Don't touch it. And Saul kept some of it, and it worked out to his own detriment. And likewise, if God gives you something, he wants you to give it away. He doesn't want you to keep it. God knows. That's his to begin with. He wants you to use it for his kingdom and his glory. But more than that, if your relationship with God isn't progressing, and you're not thinking you're going to hear God speak, you failed. Jesus said it himself, hey, my sheep hear my voice. I mean, he blessed those that even if they believed in the, the Son of God, the Son of Man, just because the disciples believed then they'd be blessed too. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? It goes that way, you know, if you just kind of want to, you know, meander around kind of pretending you know. But, hey, you know, I got word for you. I got news for you. I got great news, but I got good news for you. Jesus wants you to hear his voice. He said it. My sheep hear my voice and they know me. I want you to know Jesus. I want you and I promote to you and I say to you beyond any shadow of a doubt, if you want to, find the phone number. <coughs> and um, I'm going to sneeze again. <coughs> Excuse me. God bless you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You know, the Zygazoon, you know why they say God bless you? Because it was an old Jewish tradition that, you know, they thought demons come in after you blow out, you know, your spirit, then you have to have a spirit come in. Well, they said demons come in, so you have to bless it before the demon comes in. And Zygazoon was a Jewish way of saying it, which became Gesundheit, which became, you know, the modern Christian version of God bless you. Just a little, uh, what do they call those, paradigm or pair, one of those little things that you didn't know. But you didn't know, <laughs> that's where it comes from. So anyways... The point being is that, you know, it gets a whole new meaning to blow your brains out. Pew! You know, where'd your brains go? I gotta put it back in. Um, full of what? It's not? Not. <laughs> oh well, we won't go there. But my point being is that Jesus wants you to know him. There's no doubt about it. We, we started video ministry, the whole idea being that, hey, I thought everybody heard Jesus speak, and then I found out no, and I had to kind of like take it slow till God said go and start telling people. But you know, I, I, I assumed everybody in the Jesus movement that I was a part of, you know, everyone around me, like Greg and, you know, well, everybody, you know, Malcolm and, 
John and Chuck and Romaine and all these guys that were all over the place around, you know, which I didn't think of them as anything special. I looked at them all as just other guys too, you know, and I thought they were all just as blessed as I was, you know, so I figured they heard Jesus speak too. And they would say so in some ways, you know, about reading, you know, the Word. In those days, it was about reading the Word because God would speak through His Word, you know, and He still does. But now people have learned how to make it fit even if it doesn't really fit. Well, that's dangerous, you know. So just like the Jewish sages and scholars knew where Jesus would be born and knew when He would be born, and yet they didn't go to honor Him. They went to go kill Him as Herod sent those soldiers out and killed all the children in Jesus hometown all of them even some that weren't even old enough to be in his hometown you know killed them too oh well what are you gonna do so one of the things that God wants us to learn and to know and to grow up into is to hear his voice he's chastising the children of Israel for not hearing his voice just like today I'm gonna chastise you and I'm gonna say look if you settled for not hearing God speak audibly, you settled for a whole lot less than what God promised he would do for you. God never said that you shouldn't believe in someone you can't see, touch, or feel. He said, look, I will appear to you. I will show you. I will do things that are too marvelous for you to comprehend. God said that. If you are so carnally minded and so into the world that you don't believe that and you think that somehow you've got this theology that teaches you to settle for less than what God wants for the best meaning that you can't walk up to a mountaintop and expect Jesus to transfigure before you and start talking to you hey I got news for you that's not Pentecostalism that's reality that's the real life experience of knowing God in a personal and intimate way. And that's what Vidivo is all about, sharing Jesus in a personal and intimate way. If you don't know Jesus that way, call me. I mean, my God, you know, I'll talk to you for a while and I'll tell you, look, this is how you do it. Man, start here. Flip open a Bible. Do shotgun effect. I don't care. But watch what happens. If it fits you, you'll be blown out of the water. And then keep going. Don't stop there. Get devotional. Spend time. Pursue God. Do like Zephaniah said in the second chapter, where or third chapter, where we're talking about they didn't seek after me. They didn't get to know me. They didn't want to be meek. They didn't want to give up their idols. They, in fact, didn't want to hear what I had to say. And that's the only reason you can't hear God speak. I don't care how innocent you say you are, how righteous you say you are, how holy you say you are. If you want to hear God speak, you have to do what I did. And it's exactly what I did. I said, God, because I was going through that time where I was challenging God on everything that the pastors were teaching me. I said, God, I don't get it. This says this, and they say this, and I want this, and they say that, and I don't think that's right. And God says, you're right. I went, oh. And I didn't run up to the pastor afterwards and tell him they were wrong. I mean, maybe I should have, but I learned from the Lord, you know. And I learned later that Paul did the same thing, you know, because I was like, oh. And I learned very quickly that to whom much is given, much is required, that God put me through the ringer after learning a lot of these things because my life experience is really, you know, brings out the, the joy of the Lord, but you don't get joy by just being like, you know, some superficial Christian. You get some deep cuts. <laughs> Boy, can I tell you that God can cut deep. You know, and he gets down to the root core, you know, and he takes more and more and more, you know, until there ain't nothing left, and then you think you're going to die. And guess what? You don't, but you still think you're going to die. And he'll take more until he gets it all. But it's worth it because I've heard Jesus speak. I've heard Jesus speak audibly to me. I've heard Jesus speak to other people. I have shown people that God speaks to them. God has spoken to other people and not through me, meaning like, I'm going to tell you what the Lord says. Oh, baloney, go away. You know, I can talk to him direct. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's why I tell people. Some prophet comes up to me, thus saith the Lord. I go, well, that's nice. <laughs> I walk away and they go, well, don't you want to hear? No. <laughs> I said, if I want to know, I'll go ask him. But otherwise, no offense to you, but I can tell you what God has to say, but you don't want to hear what he has to say. Trust me, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> I don't walk away. And then they come after me. I never understood that. I'll tell them they don't want to hear what God has to say, and then they come after me to find out. No, you don't. Don't don't bug me. Leave me alone. I don't want to tell you this. And they keep coming. Oh well. And then, you know, if the Lord wants me to share with them, I'll share with them. Oops. Oh well. Such as it is. Whatever the Lord has to say, he says, you know. And I don't mean he says out of my mouth. I just like, you know, you it's a long story. So if you call me, yeah, hey, we can have a study for, you know, a while, because you won't believe it right off the bat. So, you know, you've got to kind of pursue it for a while. But 
And that's the way God works. You know, you got to pursue Him as the deer panteth after the water. So your soul's got to long after God and want God more than anything else. And I did. I mean, I was like yelling at God from parking lots out of Calvary. I mean, I'd storm out of the church, you know, after the service was over, go out in the parking lot and be yelling at God, God, what's up with this? I don't get it. You said, they said, this says, who says, what says, and how it says, you know, and Romaine, after, you know, I was out in the parking lot screaming enough times, you know, one day in a Thursday morning study, you know, I was kind of like uh, um, listening to him telling me about his own trials where he's in counseling sessions and he's talking to the Lord and he's looking forward to just chewing up this Christian. The Christian comes in and says, well, you know, I was just talking to the Lord and the Lord told me that I can't live with this gal, you know, and we got to split up before we get married and, uh, and Romaine's going, but Lord, I had it all ready. I wanted to chew him up. I wanted to attack him. I wanted to smack him. I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to bop him one, you know, and you stole my thunder, but Lord, I was having so much fun getting ready, you know, and, <laughs> you know, I love that about Romaine because that's the way I felt, you know, and feel and do feel at times still I have to kind of give it up because I already know God and let me get away with it. And I don't, you know, I don't get away with it. But in those days I was out screaming in the parking lots, you know, and I think I could, this story came to my mind right now, so I don't know if it's the Spirit of God making me remember, but I'll say it just in case, so it's on tape and, you know, somebody will say, yeah, that's true or not or whatever. But it seems like Romaine asked me one time, are you that guy that was out in the parking lot? And, you know, I think I said yes. And he said, keep it up. <laughs> and I left. You know, I was like, okay. You know, I mean, in other words, I don't know if that's a true story or my imagination running wild, but... If God is speaking to me and telling me, then it could be because there are so many things happening all the time, you know, that even if we began to write about them, like John said, of everything that Jesus said and did, you know, there wouldn't be enough volumes in the books in heaven, you know, to contain them. So I think that's a true story. I'm not sure. You know, I've never told it before, never remembered it, but suddenly it popped in my head just now, so maybe it is. But, you know, I know that with Romaine saying what he said, I knew that Romaine talked to God and God talked to Romaine. Same thing with Chuck. I always felt like Chuck had just come out of, you know, talking to the Lord and walk right out on the pulpit, you know, start teaching. Now, somebody's going to tell me, no, behind the scenes they were doing, oh, fine, whatever. I met enough of Chuck to know, you know, so I was there for two years. So, you know, you have your stories, I got mine. You know, I'll leave it in the Lord's hands and let Jesus explain to us what was going on. But my point is this, God wants to speak to you. God wants to direct you. God wants you to have his spirit inside to such a way that he abides in you that you would see God at times. You would hear God at times. You would know God in an intimate and personal way. You would have a relationship. Yes, you might stay stuck in circumstantial ways that God does open door, closed door, open door, closed door. What if he takes you up an elevator? I always wondered about that. The door automatically opens. So if you go up, do you open up automatic? I mean, you know. Open door, closed door. God said he gave you open door, so I wonder what happened to the open door, closed door, circumstantial Christian in that circumstance. Well, close the door, Lord. God says, no, I gave you an open door. Oh, well, there went the whole idea of, Lord, you know, it's an open door, go through it, closed door, you don't go through it. Oh, well, you know, maybe for some they can and don't and do and did and whatever. I don't know, maybe that's his hand instead of the door closed. But my point is this, there's circumstantial Christians and then there's the, uh, Kawinka dink ones, you know, that they're reading their Bible every day and then suddenly that part fits for today. Oh, okay, you know. Same way that I read devotionals, I say it fits for today. Well, I do think so, but, you know, that's because God speaks so, you know, and if he speaks so and does so, then according to my measure of faith, he does so. And so as God is doing, then you see it and you know it. And, you know, God will, even as I'm going through the day, God will speak to me along the way because he promised he would speak in my ear, he would speak in the word, he would speak in circumstance, he would speak in life, he would send messengers, he would do this, he would do that, he would be behind me, before me, about me, he would lead me if I would just listen, if I would just obey, if I would just, as Zephaniah says, draw near, if I would just, as he said in verse, chapter 3, verse 2, obey the voice. She obeyed not the voice, she received not correction, she trusted not in the Lord, she drew not near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Boy, doesn't that sound like Christians today? God wants us to go to war. Our heroes are dying. Let us go kill ISIS. Let us go fight. Let us go tear them up. Let's go kill Muslims. Let's go, you know, join you know, the United Nations or some other place, you know, so we can fight another war after and make another war out of the war. We just fought to end the war so that we can have another war based upon the war we just stopped and started because that created another vacuum so that we could have someone else come up and stand up and fight with us because we're doing the same thing that they told us not to do about war. Because war produces war and we keep producing more wars because we're going to war. 
Yeah, tell me about young princes that act like lions. That's what we're doing in America, acting like lions, using violence to promote violence, and all we're getting is violence out of it. Her princes within are roaring. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till the morrow. Evening wolves, they gnaw not the bones till tomorrow. They postpone things. You know you how you draw it out? You know, not now, later. You know, and then you forget about it or, you know, you don't get it done. And somehow, you know, it's like the next day. Then they chew on it. Well, we'll take care of that. You know, justice isn't done immediately. They don't answer according to what God says to do today. But they wait until tomorrow. Yeah, I get it. Wolves protecting their prey until the next day. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons, but priests have, her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Ow. You know, I gotta say it, but if, you, you know, if you're a Christian and you can use the word violence, then you're wrong. There's nothing in gospel, there's nothing in God, there's nothing in the spirit of God, there's nothing in the kingdom of heaven that's going to allow you violence. I'm sorry, you may think that you get to judge angels, you may think that you get to render, you know, well, I'm a tree inspector, you know, I'm going to judge the fruit, you know. You may think that you get to play God, but you're going to die like a man. You know, the scripture teaches that, you know, now they are gods, but they'll die like men. And in America, they're acting like gods. We have to protect ourselves. Where does it say that? Where does it say your strength comes from? Where does it say your protection comes from? Does it come from your strength of arms? Does it come from your, you know, automatic burglary alarm system? Does it say I should go out and get a gun with a gun, buy a gun and use a gun on those that God has said no, but I will save them. I'll send them to your door. They may break in wanting to, like somebody keeps telling me, they'll break in wanting to rape and pillage and steal your wife, but I've got news for you. I'm going to change their mind when they walk in your door if you welcome them in the name of the Lord and I'll change their hearts if you just witness Jesus to them. Because that's what happened to the woman in Florida. She says, look, I don't know much about this gospel thing. I don't know much about God, but I can tell you that you're here for a purpose. And I've been reading this book, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, purpose driven, you know, it's kind of like God is talking to me in it. And, you know, do you know God? I mean, you know, I don't know if you know God. but And the guy that came who had already killed people, broken out of prison, the life story of that woman is, guess what? Her testimony was that she didn't get raped. She didn't get, she got tied up, but she didn't get raped. She got a chance to witness. So don't tell me, O oh thou Christian, who says you have the Spirit of God, the teachings of God, the pastoring and the church taught theology, and all your dogmas in a row, and your hermeneutic and homiletic is in line, and you turn around and say, oh, by the way, I'm going to join the army and kill someone. Right. Now, don't get me wrong, I honor and respect a person who's willing to give up a certain portion of their life in order to serve men. Now, they're not serving God. Don't get this wrong. You're not joining the military to serve God. You're joining the military to serve men. Men that are in authority above you, you are a slave to the system that is the militaristic system of a nation that is nationalistic to the point of trying to say to you, you do it or die, almost. Close to Roman culture where a soldier had to do their duty or die. You can do some portion of objection to certain orders, but within reason, God himself says, look, you sold yourself, slave. You do what your master says, and your master is not God in the military. Your master is the commander-in-chief. So if you're knocking President Obama and you're in the military, you're going against God. Sorry, that's the way it works. Now... That violence, you know, you don't tell me that God needs violence because even the children of Israel, when they decided to assemble an army, God says, watch this. I want to show you something else. This time we're not going to use the army. This time we're going to use a bee. And he uses a bee to send the Assyrians away. Now, I don't know what kind of bee that was, but boy, talk about having a bee in your bonnet. And that's where we get that expression from. They got a bee in their bonnet and they split. The bee in the bonnet is talking about that occasion where the army came, you know, and God sent a bee, and I guess it stung the general or somebody, and then they heard something from their faraway country, and they had to split, you know, and it was a bee in his bonnet, you know, and kind of took off, and God used a bee to demonstrate that he, as opposed to the bee, is the one who does things with people. He causes other nations, chastising the children of Israel. Even when they went too far, the nation was condemned for doing it too far. 
or sending them for salvation, like into Egypt at first, and then went too far, and they had to be delivered from Egypt. The point of it being is God intervenes in the affairs of man. God is as real as you want him to be, or not, as the case may be. So if you are using violence for your objection and your observation to do things according to violent means, then you're the violent man. And if you do a Bible study on the violent man, it says there's no way in hell that God is going to take a violent man into heaven. He has to change his ways. He has to be imputed with righteousness. He has to be given something he can't do for himself, salvation. doesn't mean you can take grace and start killing everyone. Because if you get grace and mercy, you're condemned if you're going out and killing someone. Did you realize that? The grace you were given was meant to be given to someone else. Grace for grace. You don't get a free gift and then get around to turn around and deny it to someone else. You have to give grace to that person. So I got news for you. Don't put yourself in jeopardy. Don't get yourself in the position where you have to kill or be killed. Because God will lead you away from that. There's even police officers who have said, you know, I was 30 years on the force, never pulled my gun. Gee, you think God was with them? The people whose God is the Lord, God is with them. But the people whose God is not the Lord, guess what? They are depending upon all their fearful, fearless ways of demonstrating that they have no faith in God, but absolute faith in God. Trust God that whether we live or whether we die, we live unto the Lord and we die unto the Lord. And Jesus stands there in the midst of the fire with the three who made that statement. So too you, O Christian, you don't have an option. Get rid of your guns. Put your guns away. Don't keep them in your house today so that some other idiot who doesn't have the Spirit of God will pick them up and shoot you. Dare I say that those people who vacuum their mind of something and they get so upset that they go over the top with violence, they become demon-possessed right after that. You know, as soon as they reject whatever it is going on, then yeah, they get so wrapped up that at the last minute they kill someone first, then kill themselves. You always know a demonic possessed person because not only is it self um, beating of self or you know causing physical and spiritual harm to yourself but that it kills someone else first and then kills themselves that's how you know it's demonic it crosses the line to where Satan even enters their heart and so in that spirit, you know then yeah there's a problem there you know and so I have an issue with those that say that you know Someone who commits suicide, you know, will, you know, go to hell? No, because did they kill someone else? Well, I don't think they were demon-possessed. But if they went out and slaughtered ten people before they killed themselves, I might have a problem with them being in heaven. You know, I don't know. God will, God will accordingly give a measure of judgment to that person. If their name was written in the last book of life, they go there. If they don't, they don't. That's the only way I can tell you to make... A complete confident statement about trusting in God's judgment as opposed to man's man looks on the outward things whatever he did God looks on the heart I do know demonic people that kill other people first before killing themselves that I know is demon demoniacal if that keeps you from heaven that's the reason why rejection of the Spirit of God inside you and you rejected the name of the only Son of God who could save you from your sins rejection of the very nature that God had placed within you and completely absolving yourself from God's hand working in you to save you from yourself even. And so violence is not what God is wanting for you. God, violence is not something that God has taught you. There's nothing in the Sermon on the Mount that lets you get away with violence. Nothing. There is no place in Scripture that lets you have violence. Jesus came and he said, look, you've heard it said an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you. He changes it right there. He says, look, no, that's not what you do. This is what you do. Because I'm dying for everyone, you don't do that no more. You do what I tell you to do. And then God substantiated it. And then Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Look, you, you say you do these things. Well, these are my sayings. Then here you are if you do them. If you don't do them, you'll be devastated. And you will. So you got to do what God says to do. And it even says that her priests have polluted the sanctuary. You know, it's kind of interesting that we now have coffee machines in the sanctuary. Buy your coffee before you get in. Bring your coffee into the sermon. Bring your food into the sermon. Let's sell out in the foyer, you know, everything we can. Christian book, Christian labels, Christian this, Christian that. You know, if God was going to ask me what I thought about, you know, the American Christianity today, I'd say, I'd rather be a Catholic. At least I know that if I go to Catholic Cathedral, I'm not going to be buying something inside the sanctuary. 
I'm not going to be drinking coffee in the pew. I'm not going to be doing, I may see a lot of idols out there, but you know what? I see the American idol based upon commercialism right there in the church. And it's, well, we want to make it convenient for our people. Then send them down the street. Get it out of the sanctuary. Don't tell me those churches that offer all these goodies, you know, because you spent so many hours studying there that you can't go down the street and witness to those that are ungodly and get them godly. Well, no, you know, we, we want to have it inside the church. Exactly. That's what God is saying. You got it inside his sanctuary. Because I got news for you. There is absolutely nothing in a house of prayer that says you should have coffee, food, drinks, money, taking tithes, taking offerings, and having all these things inside the sanctuary. Got news for you. You may even be surprised to find that, you know, all your modern ideas of, you know, broadcast comes from rock operas and rock stars more than it comes from God. God may not want you to do that. If Jesus himself could speak on the Sermon on the Mount and everybody heard him, do you really need to have acoustics? Do you really need to have your sound system? Do you really need to put up this, you know, like we do, digital board? Now, don't get me wrong. I am a techie. I'm all into techie. But I admit, I admit, without a shadow of a doubt, without even quavering in my mind, that is not God when I walk into a sanctuary. You know, it's like, no, this is an assembly hall. This is a place of... Of people getting together. It's not what we would call a sanctuary. Absolutely not. Because it's, a, it's full of idols. It's full of false teaching. It's full of wrong. And you're not going to tell me that that's prayer. You may do prayer and that you could worship and pray anywhere. Of course, that's what Jesus said. But he said they will not worship here, nor will they worship on the mountaintop, nor will they worship in your sanctuary, but they'll worship me in spirit and in truth. And don't tell me the spirit's only occupied there, you know, in front in your sanctuary. No, it's in here. It's in our heart. So really, that's why we go outside the church, because we want to remind the church that it's not about what's inside, and it's not about what's outside, but it's what's contained within us. For the kingdom of heaven is all about us. And we, if we focus on anything else, like if you're focused in on the words up there, you're not worshiping. If you've got to open your eyes to see what the words are, you're not there, buddy. That's why you don't hear God speak. If you've got to have a mic and the mic goes out and you can't keep talking, then guess what? The reality is that's your God, not God speaking through you. Because that's what we do. We don't care if you're recorded. If it stops, well, I'm not stop talking. I keep right on going. Trust me, my wife knows. <laughs> It's like, I'm speaking to angels here. You know, God's listening. God wants me to go for it and go with it and go to it. And so that's why you need to be careful about what the priests are doing. Be careful about what you're doing. Remember these words that Zephaniah says about the violence and then about the pollution of the sanctuary. Yeah, it's polluted. So I still go. I still deal with them. You know, I just know that it's polluted. I admit it. Yeah, it's polluted. You know, it's like, well, you know, okay. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Even the very temple of this, of of uh, the temple Jesus went into. It had gotten corrupted. There's no doubt about that. Jesus said, the zeal of my father's house will consume me. And he didn't beat the tax collectors or anybody with a whip. Good God, how false can you be when he says that not even a bruised reed will he, or not even a smoking flax would he quench, or a bruised weed, reed would he, or a reed, a bent reed would he bruise. That's pretty gentle. If you don't know what a bruised reed is, then you need to go look at one and see if he's going to whip someone or tells you to go out and get a sword. There's no violence in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God suffered violence and the violence take it by force is what Jesus said. And I've heard so many bad interpretations of that. It simply meant the kingdom of God suffered violence. It allows it to go on. It allows those that are violent to kill people in the name of God and suffers that kind of violence to attack people, but in the end, they're judged. So it suffers violence. The kingdom of God suffers violence and it's violent taken by force. The violence will take it by force. They will act upon their own violent nature until the last battle is done. Armageddon, when Jesus comes and says, literally, probably, peace, be still. Boom! Everybody's destroyed because he's the Prince of Peace. There can be no action after God says, peace, be still. I have cut off, the just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning does he bring his judgment to light. He fails not. But the unjust knows no shame. Man, you know, we might not even make it through this. It's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Isn't this what God is telling us every day to do? 
Isn't this what God says that he's going to do and look at us and talk to us and come to us and say, look, here's what I'm doing. The just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will judge not. He will not do iniquity. He's not going to mess you up, but he's going to do this. Every morning doth he bring his judgment to light. Every morning he meets you. Every morning he judges you. Joy cometh in the morning. Sorrow endures for but an evening. We were just told that the lions, they'll be holding their prey until morning. And then here we go. God says, I'm not going to do iniquity. I'm not going to beat you down. I'm going to talk to you about what I've seen and what I've heard and what I know and judge you accordingly. So repent. So in the morning, do your Bible study. Do your studies. Listen to the voice of the Lord. Do your devotional. We're going to stop here because this is just too good. This is too goody. Every morning, every morning, I mean, my God, if, if there was ever anything that would tell me that, you know, video, video, video devotionals is so right on. Here it is in Zephaniah verse 5, you know, chapter 3. You know, the Lord's not going to do iniquity, but every morning he brings his judgment to light. He fails not. He's doing it every morning. Do you get this? I got to keep saying it. Every morning, every morning, every morning. Which morning? Every morning. Why do you read your Bible every day? Because every morning God's bringing judgment to light. Why do I meet with God every day? Because every morning God brings judgment to light. Why do I talk to God every day? Because every day God brings judgment to light. Why does Jesus meet with God in before long before morning? Because God brings judgment to light. He said, look, Jesus, this is what I want you to do today. Do you get it yet? Every morning. Now, my wife, man, every morning she reads her Bible. <laughs> I got news for you. I don't, but, hey, I do in a way, but, you know, it's a long story. But, you know, it's not the way she reads it. She's really, like, diligent. I mean, Dogmatic, like, wow, every day. He fails not, but the unjust knoweth no shame. You know what that means in context? we got to put this into perspective. Because this is, after all, Zephaniah telling us what to do. He's already told us to seek the Lord. He's already told us to draw near the Lord. Now he's telling us every morning, every morning seek the Lord. Every morning, draw near to the Lord. Every morning, hear His voice. Every morning, God's bringing judgment to light. Do you get it? God's trying to clean you up. God's trying to fix you up. God's trying to straighten you up. And I got news for you. If you don't get up and get right and get on with it with God, guess what? The judgment says that the wicked and the ungodly knoweth no shame. Can I say something to you? If you don't get up in the morning and spend time with God, you know no shame. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. I don't care if you're a morning person or not. Every morning it says. He doesn't say without, you know, question. You know, you don't feel like it, don't go. He says every morning the Lord bring a judgment to light. Every morning. We got something here that God is trying to make aware or very clear. You don't want to seek the Lord? Fine. You don't want to hear from the Lord? Fine. You don't want to draw near to God? Fine. Go to hell. Because that's what it's about. Zephaniah isn't kidding because we're talking about, as he spoke of in chapter 2 and chapter 1, about those that might be spared the great tribulation, might go in the rapture, might be spared all these things that are about to come upon the world during Jacob's troubles. You might get away with what you're doing. But Je Zephaniah is making it very clear. You're not going to get away with iniquity. You're not going to get away with sin. You're not going to get away with not seeking the Lord. You're not going to get away with not drawing near to Him. You're not going to get away with not hearing His voice. You're going to be brought to judgment every morning. And every morning when Jesus is there trying to meet with you to talk to you about it, guess what? Here's my calendar. Where were you? Where were you? So I got news for you today. Where are you? I mean, are you onto a Sunday, Wednesday program? You know what I mean? Good luck with that. That's not Jesus meeting with you. That's the church meeting with you. If you got a Tuesday, Thursday schedule going, hey, whew, whew, wonderful. Who are you meeting with again? Because I got news for you. Every morning, God Almighty is meeting with you. Whether you're there or not, whoa, I would suggest getting a hold of you know your lawyer and talking to him about this uh, court order date that he's saying every morning, the Lord brings judgment to light. Every morning he comes to meet with you. Every morning he's looking to see you. Every morning he wants to talk to you. Every morning he wants to bring his mercy and grace. 
Every morning He wants to give you His forgiveness and love. Every morning He wants to renew His covenant with you. Every morning He wants to fill you with His power and His might. So, the real question you have to ask yourself is, honestly, what are you doing every morning?